guys for coming out. I know it was rainy, so I appreciate you guys coming out even through the weather and all that. Uh, this is our sixth data science workshop. Uh, David's been putting these workshops together to kind of give you a glimpse of uh, what's out there in the data science world. The sixth workshop, we're going to be kind of giving you a brief overview about machine learning subset of AI. It's very relevant to today's uh, tech world. So I feel like this this workshop will just kind of give you a brief glimpse of what's out there. Yeah. So what is machine learning? Um, I'm going to start with this quote, Herbert Simmon. It's uh, learning is any process by which a system improves performance from experience. Um, when you think of machine learning, uh, the best way of uh, picturing it is teaching a kid how to ride a bicycle. Um, you're probably, you'll be the parent for your machine learning model. Your machine learning model will try and pedal. You'll give it some training wheels. Sometimes it'll fall off and it'll learn through experience to eventually ride the bike by itself, right? So I like you to think of this analogy when, when tackling machine learning, all right? So machine learning can be broken up into three different types of learning. There's unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So back to like the bicycle analogy, unsupervised learning would be like the little kid trying to learn how to ride the bike by itself, right? It's going to fall a lot more because <laughs> the parent's not there. Um, so it kind of learns through error. And we'll talk a little bit of, about some of the models that are on unsupervised learning. We'll walk you through a specific supervised learning model, which uh, David will be doing that. Um, and then there's reinforcement learning, which is uh, similar. It'll be going through like trial and error, but um, it adjusts the algorithm um, at each kind of turn. So yes, next slide. So there's some, here's some quick examples of machine learning in your daily life. Uh, a lot of you guys use Google Maps, um, Bumble for like dating like that uses machine learning to pair you up with people with shared interests and stuff like that. Um, and then there's Netflix. They have a recommender system for based on what you've been watching and your like what you rate your ratings, people's ratings overall, it'll recommend you what movies to watch next. So that's some examples. Also listed a, a handful more on the right. Um, before we uh, go more into um, some of these, the details on in these models, I want to go back to the data preparation part. Um, the previous couple of workshops talked a lot about cleaning up data, doing some data manipulation. Um, this is a very important step in the machine learning process, making sure your model is fed with clean data. Um, there's that philosophy that keeps coming up garbage in equals garbage out meaning like if you're training your model with garbage data it's going to get garbage information out of it right um so that's like going about like teaching our going back to the bicycle model if we we're teaching the kid how to ride a bike and we don't give it the proper instructions it's going to struggle right um so there's some questions that come up when cleaning up data how do we handle missing values is a important one. Um, there's a lot of the times you won't get all like clean data. That's more often than not, I don't have an exact statistic, but um, yeah, a lot of the times data is not clean. That's the biggest struggle. And most of the effort is put towards cleaning up the data for that model. Um, so there's some questions about how, uh, how do we handle those missing values? Imputation is one of them, which is like filling in those missing values with like the average, like say we're looking at a height column for uh, people, right? And there's some missing data for like people's height. Do we fill that in with the mean height, the missing value with like, okay, just like if there's a missing height um, parameter, do I fill it in with the mean, median, or mode? Those are different types of imputation. Or if there's a missing value, do we just disregard that data entry, 
Um, that's one option. That's another option. And then a third one is using an ML model based on other features. Maybe that person weighs this much. Um, it's this ethnicity. Maybe we can predict what their height is, right, based on other data inputs. So that's a third option. Last one uh, I've talked about, there, there's a, a handful more different ways of going about fixing missing values. Um, but I want to talk about handling outliers. Um, outliers have an effect on your model. So um, you, you, you have different ways of approaching that, uh, maybe making those outlier points similar to your closest non-outlier point. Um, that's an option, it's called winterization. There's also the removing outliers option. And um, yeah, so we will go into that. Um, some different ways of tackling outliers, I guess, will be scaling, scaling your data. So um, I'm just, uh, this is just a, a graph example, um, after, before and after scaling your data. Um, the the, I don't know if you can really see it, but uh, you see like there's, this is kind of like a path right here. Uh, you see my shadow. This path is getting to the predicted value. It would have to, it, it would have to jump a, a whole a whole lot when it's uh, not scaled and normalized. But when it is normalized, the the path towards uh, the predicted values a lot. Um, Faster and sharp. You you ask something. Normalize is like um, I think scale scaling the data instead of if you can see here, um, it, the range is from zero to ten. If we if we scale it down from zero to one, we're kind of shrinking the data, so um, the the variance is not as as great. So then, um, outliers on a certain feature are kind of um, brought in a closer range to the, the, the main grouping of data. Yeah, um, I also would like to add as well, um, I actually have previous experience with like scaling and normalizing data. And I will say um, probably one of the most common applications of like normalizing would be like imagery, imagery data. So usually like, you know how like there's pixel values for each like image to go from zero to like 255. Usually you want to like scale it and like normalize it so it's like from zero to one. And that's like basically what allows it to like reduce the amount of variance. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's like one application of like, you know, normalization. So, so when you look at those outlier data, um, the error won't be shown as like, as like that's a, such a great error. Um, part three would be uh, for preparation is like feature engineering. Um, I think binning data is, is, a, is a clever way of, I guess, making your data a little more simple. Um, instead of using like a range of age numbers, you can kind of group uh, them into three values, which would be like child, adult, teenager, something like that. Um, text processing, when you're working with like text, like Twitter data, um, removing words that um, don't have a strong weightage, like the, and, a. Um, once you remove those, then you're kind of working with the textual data that's more significant for, like, I guess, sentiment. Um, there's some libraries that exist which you can use. Um, and then creating new features. This is just an example. Uh, feature X1 and X2 can be combined to be feature X3. There may be some different applications. Um, those are just depending on whatever problem you are trying to solve. Um, so supervised learning, before we get into the Jupyter Notebook, um, I wanted to kind of talk about how, how it works. This was going back to the example of the riding the bike thingy. This is, this is where you're the parent and you're helping your, your kid ride that bike, right? Um, so you have data, you have, you have da data that's labeled, right? So we have, a, we have circles and X's in the, the top, right? Now we have this one data point. You see the yellow point up there. Um, we don't know what, what's that, what's the classification for that one. Um, 
but based on I guess training our model we kind of are able to to draw like a boundary right and that would be the the machine learning model so anything to the right of that boundary will be classified as green anything to the left of it would be classified as a blue circle right so from this model you can kind of predict if something is lying to the right of it so the yellow unknown um unknown data point it's going to be classified as as green so um the training part of the the set is is i guess trying to to read in all the data points that have already been labeled so like those are verified and you know okay here's where all the uh the blue points are and then the, the green ones and then it's kind of like you're creating we we'll go into some examples of linear regression and stuff like that but um that's training the model so we can determine like the slope of that boundary line right and then later on we'll be the, the that data set original data set is split into a validation and test set um the validation one is kind of angling the the boundary line so it fits where it needs to be um and then the test set will show will show it later on how it's go, how how does our model perform on unseen data. So yeah. Let's go to the notebook. Yep. Oh, you didn't have some. Okay. Uh yeah. So yeah, it's pretty much our notebook. I guess like before we get started, I kind of just want to like tease you guys on a kind of like a true or false question. So basically in order to understand machine learning. You'll definitely need like a strong background in like programming. Uh, how many guys think it's true? How many guys think it's how many of you guys think it's false? Or I guess like raise your hand, or just you raise your hand if you think it's true, true or false. You know. Okay, cool. Um, can you explain why it's false? Okay, yeah, that's a pretty good point. So, um, anybody else have a? Oh, oh I kind of revealed it. My oh, bad. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I guess like to you know, if you want a good, better understand machine learning, you definitely want to have not just a good background in statistics, but also math. Like sometimes you'll definitely need like background with like linear algebra, so like how to like deal with matrices. Because when you're dealing with, let's say a data frame, for example, that itself is like a, like a matrix, you know? So it's something to keep in mind. Um, definitely statistics knowledge you need to know. Whenever you guys are evaluating like a, like a model, you'll definitely want to measure like how much does a how much does a model like get like you know like accurate like how does it like pre predictly I'm sorry my language sucks um how well does it usually predict a point to a certain degree in other words like how much does it get true positives how many times does it usually get like false negatives and usually the in betweens like how many times does it usually like get like a false negative or a false positive these are these are definitely things to keep in mind um. You also need like a strong domain knowledge of the data you're working with. Sometimes like you'll be working like, you know, with data you probably don't know much about. So it definitely like before, like you do some, you know, some feature engineering and then like, you know, creating a model of that. It's definitely like important to do some exploratory data analysis. Hence why you kind of want to do like all like the data cleaning and all the data visualization and all that, but to like better understand the kind of data and that's kind of like what we worked on like over the past previous weeks if you guys are here for our previous workshops but um yeah does anyone have any other questions nope okay you have a question what's the supervised learning in that context the supervised one um that that one would be the oh sorry you got it yeah okay. that would be um oh, i think the next slide next slide so you're you're given data that's already been classified so um this example right here imagine there's no colors here this is the unsupervised learning. It's just like all of it is one color, right? The the model is going to 
figure out, okay, we can kind of, we can give, the only information we'd say is like, I want three clusters, right? It will see, okay, there's a mean here, there's a mean here, and, and there's a mean here. And then it'll kind of cluster the, the surrounding data points around there into those classifications. And it'll do it by itself. All you have to do is specify how many clusters you want. That's that's one example of like unsupervised learning. The supervised learning here, we're giving the model, okay, all of these points right here are um, blues, and then all of these ones are green, right? So we're telling the model that that's what it is, right? And then um, based on the information we provide, it, it kind of builds that linear regression line. I think in, um, what's it called? In, in like some of your physics labs before you plotted like a line of best fit, right? Um, so this line of best fit will kind of separate the data out for you. So then I guess given like this yellow point right there, you um you're given an x value and it'll predict whether or not it's green or um blue so i guess the supervised part is giving the giving the data mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah so we this is unlabeled this one is uh, this is unlabeled the supervised learning is labeled so yeah, yeah. All right. Does anyone have any other questions or? Okay. Um. In that case, yeah. Let's move on. Um. So yeah. So we're gonna start off with like scikit learn. So oftentimes scikit learn is oftentimes the kind of like the basic machine learning package that a lot of data data scientists use. So it kind of like provides like a lot of like efficient tools to like you know to utilize for your data analysis. And in such cases, like for your model training. So in this case, you got, let's say you have like, it'll also give you like, you know, some metric tools and all that. And also give like modeling tools, such as like, you know, linear regression models, logistic regression, k-means clustering, like the list goes on and on and on. Um, I can definitely like, if you guys like want more information, like if you guys want like a reference to it, I'll probably like link it later on, but, um. Yeah. Um, for now, we're just going to stick to like three main packages. Or I say three like main models, linear regression, logistic regression, and then like um, K nearest neighbors. And we'll go and we'll touch base on K means clustering in a bit, but like we're not going to like go deep into that. But um, yeah, basically, um, second learn, it's kind of like built on top of like the Python libraries, such as like NumPy, SciPy, Mapplib. So that's why you often like have to import like NumPy, Mapplib, oftentimes, because without those two packages, you can't use scikit-learn. So that's why you need to import those packages. And it's a really simple and consistent API to use. And there's like a bunch of machine learning algorithms that you guys can like use. So you can do like, you can choose like classification models, regression models, clustering, dimension, dimension dimensionality reduction. That was really weird. But um, yeah, but it also has model selection too. Um, so yeah, it provides a lot of useful functions for like data pre-processing, cross-validation and like performance evaluation. Evaluation. So yeah, before we get started, let's just like install Scikit-Learn. And oh, in case if anyone's like wondering, I'll be posting this notebook late, like towards the end of the workshop. So yeah, you can see it. So you guys can like, you know, play around with it if you guys want to. But uh, yeah, I'm just gonna, Install first. I should install it before, but should be fine. Okay, it's cool. And next, we're going to be importing open data sets. And I guess, like, how many guys know about open data sets so far? Like, how many guys like been to our previous workshops and like? know what open data sets is? No. No just, one? You just said. <laughs> OK. Oh, wait. It's a data set that's public. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, so basically, oh, what, what open data sets does, it's kind of like, 
it's kind of like a package made by Kaggle, or I guess what it's made as an extension to Kaggle. And what it does is it allows you to download data sets from Kaggle really quickly. So you can see here, after you import all of these, I got this Pokemon data set. Yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna be analyzing Pokemon. That's crazy, but um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what it does, it it downloads your data sets straight from Kaggle without like all the fuss of just you know downloading it and then like putting it into a notebook. So it's really easy. All you need is like your Kaggle like AP. All you need is like use your token key, and like your Kaggle username, and that's pretty much it. So I'm just gonna put my username right here, and let me just pull up my. I'll just pull up my key for a quick second. It's like a website where they post uh, open source like data sets for uh, data enthusiasts to kind of do data analysis and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, so you have like a bunch of data sets. You have like a transportation data set. You have the FIFA World Cup data set, you know? There's also like, it's also, you can also like compete in like, competitions so i know like the nfl like hosts like big data bowls or do some data analysis Challenge. and sometimes you can earn money from it so if you guys want to like, get bank then uh yeah this is probably the best it's probably like your possible way to do it although these usually get really competitive but yeah um so it looks like our data set is in we'll just double check yep it's in so Yeah, so you can see here we can read in our data set using pandas and just like that we can be able to like preview our data set so we can see here that like you got the abilities you got all like your you got pretty much like your power levels for like um special attack special defense you also got you also have like you know levels for attack and defense um and you also have like the um the generation that each Pokemon comes from. And you also have like a you also have a column called is legendary, which basically like checks if a Pokemon is like is a legendary. You'll we'll be working with this feature like later on in our notebook. But um yeah. So now that we have it downloaded, we can like, you know, we can start messing around with it, but there's not that much cleaning to do here. I didn't want to choose like a super like complicated data set. So yeah, I also kind of also kind of like have like all the D type data types for each feature. So you can see here like is legendary is an integer. I feel like you know that should be a boolean, but you know I think um we'll mess with that later on. Um, but yeah. That's pretty much the Pokemon. And so, yeah, we went over supervised learning. You know, it's pretty much so supervised learning, I guess, like what Rohit said, it's pretty much like it's where the model is trained on a labeled data set. And so it's where like the desired outputs like known for like the each input. So usually like um, the goal of like supervised learning is to learn a mapping function from input variables to output variables. So basically you want to, you want the model to predict like a dependent variable based on an independent variable in like statistic sense. So it'd be like holding up a picture of an apple to a little kid and saying, this is apple, this is pear. And eventually they'll when recognize you give it, it. When you yeah. give it in the test data set, I hold up a picture of an apple. The model has seen so many pictures of apples. When I hold up an apple, it's going to say apple, right? And then, <clears throat> yeah, so that's what. Yeah, it's the same. It's kind of the same with the cats and dogs. Like you, you train it with like images of cats, and train it with images and dogs, and sooner or, and sooner or later, the model's gonna recognize like certain patterns, and it'll like know like okay, this is definitely a cat, which is definitely a dog. You know, mm -hmm. but yeah. Oh, the algorithm is kind of like the linear regression, and like the logistic regression. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so depending on what kind of data you're working with, um, I guess image data, there's different algorithms that are helpful for, I guess, processing, processing those, uh, 
JPEGs or whatever and scaling it down. And then eventually it'll be like some RGB value and uh, it'll make, it, it'll transform it until it's like a point on a X, Y plane, right? And then you'll you'll kind of use a linear regression to all of a sudden be able to differentiate cats and dogs. So the model is basically taking in all these inputs and, and whatnot, and then um, scaling it down until it's a yes or no question. So yeah. it does all that work. And, and, and kind of like, like that's pretty much like what logistic regression is, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, but like before we get to logistic regression, I kind of want to go over linear regression first. Um, so linear regression is like pretty much, it's a type of supervised learning algorithm. It's like used for modeling the relationship between like a dependent variable or like one or more independent variables. Usually like, um, the goal of this is to kind of find a linear equation to predict the dependent variable based on the values of the independent variables. So. I guess for anyone that has, the, I guess everyone that knows basic math, you know, what's kind of like the formula for like linear regression? That's true. Yeah. There's also another version of it. It's um, y equals a plus b times x. So usually, yeah. So a will, so a, or I guess in this case, um, b would probably be the, um, Y intercept and like B and then like M is kind of like the slope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's true. So yeah, you gotta like have all these different data points. And usually what the linear regression model does is that it kind of makes a line of regression between the dependent variable and the independent variable. So that's what we'll be doing here. So you can see here that um We'll be performing linear regression analysis on our Pokemon data set based on the relationship between the Pokemon base total and the special tax value. So we can see here, like for our Y, we have the special attack. So basically we're trying to predict a Pokemon's like special attack power based like on their base total. And so what we're doing is that we're setting the Y to special attack. We're setting the, the X to base total. I also have like the dot reshape functions at the end. And kind of like the reason why we did this is that um pretty much we want to we want to be able to like input these arrays as like kind of like two-dimensional arrays. It's kind of weird, but think about it as like each number is like its own array. So that's why it's like a two-dimensional array. Um that that's what you call like the normalization. It's called normalization and stuff. That's the normalization okay. process. Mm -hmm. That's true. So yeah. Once you're able to set the X and Y. Then you should be able to like, you know, instantiate your linear regression model. You can be able to fit it with these two, like with these two like variables over here. And based on the X value, it should be able to predict the Y value based on those X, based on those like those X variables, the X variable. Um, so you can see here, I kind of plotted it over here. So you can see here, you have the special tech over here and the base total over here. And you have like the linear regression line over here along with the dots. And so what it does, that uh, it kind of like shows like, yeah, there's usually there's a strong positive relationship between special tech and base total. And so based off of that, it's going to be able to, you know, to predict correctly what value the special attack is going to be based on like, you know, the value of the base total of a Pokemon. Uh, does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about linear regression? Well, it's kind of math. Uh, I think it's just mostly statistics, right? Yeah, it's just mostly statistics and like and like just a little bit of math because like the math part's just the the um the y equals m x plus b, oh. you know? Yeah. You can manually like. You, we're just using a library right now, but you can manually make a linear regression formula uh, function, right? So then um, I guess like by feeding it each point, you're kind of getting that line best fit, just the y equals mx plus b, right? And then eventually once we have the the m value for that slope and the b, right? 
then we can start taking in okay the pokemon's uh, what was it the base total just we, we, you give us a base total and we'll predict like what the uh, what the power of the special, the attack, special is. attack is going to be yeah. because we've we've had this data set right uh so that that's that that's what um like its application would be once we have trained this model yeah okay so um yeah does anyone else have any other questions or no okay so yeah next part next uh, model we're going to touch on is logistic regression we've kind of spoke about this before with like i guess with apples pears and like bananas but um it's basically like it's a type of supervised learning algorithm that you use for like binary classification problems so like where the dependent variable only has to predict like two or more possible outcomes so it's like yes or no or like true or false so like usually the the goal of logistic regression is kind of like to find the best fitting curve that can predict the probability of a certain outcome based on the values of the independent variable so you can see here like over here let's say we're trying to say like okay is this you have a dog or you have a dog is this really a dog and basically, like with the model, say it will predict if it's true or false. And so, if it's true, like it'll be over here. If it's false, it'll be right over here. If you're throwing like some, if you throw something like a pear, we'll probably predict a false because it's supposed to be a dog, but it's not. It's a pear, so it'll be over here. So yeah, we'll be doing the same thing with the Pokemon data set as well. We'll be predicting whether a Pokemon is a legendary. So like previously with the linear regression, like you're assuming a linear relationship between like special attack and base total. So you can like predict the special attack value based on like the base total of a Pokemon. So for this, which is a regression model, we're kind of like, you can predict kind of like the, um let's say, whether Pokemon is legendary based on like a bunch of like different features. Like you can predict it on like HP, special attack and like a lot more for this one we're probably just going to stick with we're going to stick with speed i feel like speed would be much easier to predict legendary pokemon usually fast so yeah we'll use that um i think there's one other thing i wanted to yeah, go ahead. mention um <clears throat> back in this example um we we kind of already know that there is a linear correlation between those two variables um, I think another thing worth mentioning is before when doing the data exploration, taking finding the correlation between all the variables and seeing that there is a correlation, then we can use them all. If there isn't a correlation, I don't think any of these like linear regression functions, logistic regression functions will yeah. work. So the important step is first knowing that there is a correlation between those two. Yeah, variables. and it's also important. And that's why you know you want to perform exploratory data analysis mm -hmm. so you can like better understand like the relationship between two variables mm -hmm. and a bunch of both bunch of other things but um if this line wasn't drawn um we can kind of see like the data is work like moving in a kind of linear way right yeah um i think an, another thing is like i guess a, a way we could do this is having multiple plots uh of all the different combination of variables and that's one part of the exploratory process. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. So yeah, going back to logistic regression, but yeah. So again, we're trying to predict whether a Pokemon is, is legendary. Mm -hmm. For this time, we're going to do speed. So yeah, we're going to pull up the logistic regression function from the linear model package. We'll also be pulling out another important tool that we can use. So usually like when it comes to training a model, sometimes when it's like a big data set, you can usually like split the data towards like you have like one part, one major part of data that's just training data and the other parts just like testing data. And so over here we'll have train test split. And what it does is that it kind of splits the data to where it's like, okay, you can have like about 20% of the data be like for testing data and like 80% of the training data. 8% could be like for training data. So that way you'll be using the training data to train your model and you'll be able to use your testing data in order to see if it like if, if it like accurately predicts like the y values based on the based on the testing values of the y variable. Um 
Does that make sense? Or okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go ahead and run this. Oh, and I should be I should mention, but um, crap, I forgot something. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can see here, it's able to like accurately predict it. So usually, um, three metrics you want to keep in mind when it comes to evaluating evaluating a model is accuracy, precision, and recall. So I think a lot of you guys may know what, what accuracy, is, accuracy is, but if case you guys don't know, it usually measures the overall correctness of the model's predictions. So usually like how many of these, how many of the predicted values did it get correct compared to the tested values. You also, another thing you also wanna look out for is precision. What does that, it, it measures the percentage of the true positives out of all the positive predictions. In this case, it kind of got majority of the true positives right. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty good. Um, there's also recall, which like measures the percentage of true positives out of all the actual positive samples. So what it does, that it's kind of like, it takes the true positives and it compares it with like all the true, true positives and the false negatives. So like false negatives are like, let's say a Pokemon isn't legendary, but in fact, it's actually is a legendary, you know? So all different ways of seeing how good our model is at guessing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think another thing I want to mention is uh, the trust, the test and train split. Um, since we were working with small data sets, like I, I think 20%, 30% is okay. Um, but when working with big data in like the real world industry and all that, a lot of the times the test train split is going to be like 1% test, 99% uh, training. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that that's, that's what it is when you have like bigger computers and stuff like that. Um, they spend a lot of time doing the uh, training and then the testing is a, uh, just like very minimal. Yeah. I've been working with like I think it's just because the size of those data sets are so huge that they keep the the um I I I think um uh, forget the example of, of of why but I just remember from a video mentioning that yeah I think this trust I, I can get back to you on that yeah. yeah. I should also like mention as well. Um, this is kind of another aspect of feature engineering, but for is legendary, it's usually like values of zero or one. If you want to manipulate it, you could do it to where it's like it's like true or false. So you can make it a bool, like a bool feature instead of like an integer feature. That's kind of like one way you can do some feature engineering on this data set before you actually train it. But yeah. That's pretty much it. Um, does anyone have any questions about like, in terms of like accuracy, accuracy, precision metrics, or just anything related to the logistic regression model? Any doubts, concerns? No? Okay. Um, so here's, so here's the thing. So linear regression and logistic regression have like different use cases. I would say linear regression is useful if you just want to generate like, let's say like a line of regression, like this one here. So you can be able to predict like a Y value based on like, like a dependent variable based on like several independent variables. So whereas like for logistic regression, it's kind of like for classification. So you want to be able to like classify like which pictures a dog or which pictures a cat, you know? So like there's different use cases to like using it. It's just a matter of like which model fits best for you, you know? Like I wouldn't like have you like pick like a random model and just like train it with some random data. Like it's important to better understand your data, being able to feature it and trying to decide like which one, which model is worth it for you, you know? And so, and sometimes in like extreme use cases, like you have to like resort to like a neural network, mm. but that's kind of like something we'll touch on later on. It's, I think the stronger the correlation, then yeah. you'd probably use a linear 
if it's like kind of weaker then i think we do so Right. So is everyone good? All right, cool. Um yeah, so next next kind of like uh good I'm gonna touch on is K nearest neighbors. So it's kind of like another algorithm for like classification and regression problems. But like the basic idea of it is like you predict it, you predict the class or value of a new data point based on the class or value of its nearest neighbors. Mm -hmm. So like you want to predict at one point based off like its nearest points that are right next to it. So like for example, like you have this green dot here, like you're trying to decide like whether or not to like have it belong to this area, this group of points, or like this group of points. And so like the K represents like the number of like nearest neighbors to consider. And like the algorithm kind of like calculates the distance between the new data point and like the other data points in the training data set. And then it selects the K nearest neighbors. So um, I guess like one example here is that I kind of set the number of neighbors to be like five. So when you actually like run this model here, it kind of like, it kind of like generates the same number of, it kind of generates the same accuracy and like precision as the logistic regression model. So you can use, K nearest neighbors or like logistic regression to do like classification if you guys want to. But um you have to, but what's important here is that you want to also like decide like how many neighbors you want. So like let's say you want to do like three neighbors. You can see here that the accuracy gets lower and like the precision gets lower as well. And the recall score gets a bit higher. So um yeah, it's important to kind of like figure out like how many neighbors you want, you know, like what kind of value of K you need. And I think there is a method to it. Usually it's called the elbow method, but I kind of forgot how it works, but yeah. So recall score is kind of like the, um, it's like the percentage of true positives out of like all the pos positive samples, you know? Yeah. And like over here, this is kind of how you calculate it here. So yeah, I definitely like recommend like using this kind of like diagram here to like, you know, find out how many true positives there are and how many like false negatives, false positives and true negatives. So you can like, you know, figure out your accuracy and precision by yourself. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it for supervised learning. Uh, next thing, I'm probably going to go over this real quick because we have some couple of slides we want to go over. Mm -hmm. But um, next thing here is unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning is kind of like a type of machine learning where the goal of it is to find patterns and relationships in data where like it's not really labeled or like pre-categorized. So in other words, like the algorithm is not provided like with any information about the correct output or desired target. So instead, like the out, the unsupervised learning models, like to kind of like analyze the input data and try to like identify patterns and like structures that can help to like group or cluster similar data points together. So like one like common technique is clustering, like which involves like grouping similar data points together based on like similarities in features in in our features and stuff. Uh, we kind of like touched based on it with like. K nearest neighbors where you kind of have to like classify one point and like decide like where it belongs to like this cluster or like the other cluster here. But I mean, I guess what's different is that like, um, what would you say is different about like K nearest neighbors and like K means clustering? K means clustering probably might be like the first step. Um, like you said, the, un the unlabeled part of it is a big, uh, differentiator between the two right mm -hmm. so when you're working with unlabeled data the model's never seen it before you've never seen it before you don't know what to make of it um you run this algorithm it starts to classify these groupings right uh, <clears throat> and then from there once we have these uh groupings maybe like we have a, a new x and we want to figure out where which cluster it belongs in Problem at, you can use KNN to classify that. Yeah. So that that 
I think um, right now we all the examples we've showed you is just like two dimensional, right? X, Y. We're only working with two two uh, variables. But when you apply like linear algebra to this stuff, you can start looking at things in three dimensions for like n n number of dimensions, right? So you're taking in a lot more features into account. Um, we can't visualize it because we we only live in a three three D world, right? Um, but these computers can, right? You, you, um, and I guess like the linear algebra topics kind of um, help you understand how to apply that logic to n number of dimensions. All right. We can go back to the slides, I think, right? Yeah, sure. Does anyone have any other questions, though, before we move on? No? Okay. We covered uh, how to evaluate models, right, um, using the precision recall and stuff. But I just want to talk a little bit briefly about neural networks. Um, I, I feel like um, explaining the code would be a little bit difficult so i just wanted to give you a brief overview of it um i really encourage you guys like if you have the opportunity to take cs 171 you should definitely take it it's a very relevant course um probably the top three in my opinion at this school right um that you can take and um or you can learn deep learning by yourself i think at the end i'll give you a good link for um how to how to learn this stuff by yourself but um a lot of the lead researchers and innovators in this field aren't actually data science or computer scientists they are um neuroscience people and psychology people um they're trying to get computers to start replicating behavior kind of like how our brains work right um so the neural network is kind of shaped based off of how a neuron behaves. So the dendrites are kind of like the first layer of a neural network. That's where it takes in like, in, like us ourselves, we take in images, we take in uh, audio input from our ears, right? And in each layer, nucleus, um, there's some operations that are being happened. We are understanding what um, a specific images, the colors, the textures, all that stuff. Each neuron has its own job. It processes information, figure out what it means, right? Um, some of them, they they kind of give answers to what the, those pictures are saying. So they do some transformations. Um, and then I guess this kind of is, this application is really broad. Uh, you can build neural networks for understanding speech, playing video game, not playing video games, playing games. Um, so they kind of modeled this this machine learning model off of the the neuron in your brain. So we're training these models with a bunch of data and making them smarter. It's really not a nothing like oh man, these models are are getting sentient or whatever. No, they're just like really experienced because we're feeding them a lot of information, yeah? Um, and another thing I want to talk about is with all this information we're feeding them, a lot of these classes won't talk to you about um, what the effects of these models are, right? Um, I want to kind of walk you through, uh, like uh, we'll go bullet point by bullet point, but maybe like, I want you guys to kind of answer like, what do you think, what pro what part of the process do you think uh, con contributed to that outcome, right? So like the first one is like a hiring tool that discriminates against women. What, what could have made the model do that? Imagine, imagine like, Imagine our model is just like a really bad HR employee or something. What could have what could have caused this HR person who who's just like just following instructions, right? Like our model does. We we we're training it, and all of a sudden it starts doing bad things. What 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 could have caused that? Yeah. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely, definitely. Um, so this is actually an example that happened at Amazon. Um, their AI hiring system started discriminating against women. Um, the reason it did that is because the the data it was this model was being fed was from the past. So their prior past uh, hiring processes were would be hiring like Caucasian middle-aged white men, right? Um, they don't explicitly have to say these are people are Caucasian white middle-aged men, but maybe there's some proxy kind of data saying like these people are from uh, this college, this sex, this uh, this part of the world or whatever, right? So um, that kind of model all of a sudden had some bias in it. Um, the second one, AI recognizing white faces better than black faces also is another example of the data. The model was trained. It was only trained with maybe like a lot more white faces. So all of a sudden it's recognizing white faces a lot better than uh, black faces. So that that's an, a bias that comes from the data, right? Um, AI sexualizing women when generating art. I don't know, if, have any of you guys used Lenza? I was on TikTok a, a little bit ago, like people making the AI art generating. Yeah, yeah. They're like profile pictures and stuff like that. It's kind of cool. Just check it out. It's really messed up, I guess. They have a like a uh a questionnaire before uh signing up saying like, are you a man or woman? Um, what's your age and stuff like that, right? Uh I I I said I was thought it was pretty cool, so I I tried it out. It get when I when I put my photos in, maybe afterwards I'll show you guys some of the the cool pictures it generated. It showed me as an astronaut, me as a like like a uh, in in space, very like uh, adventurous and all that. And then my my friend she she did it, and she was not pleased with her responses because it really sexualized her. And kind of put her as a fairy, something feminine, um, not as adventurous as like kind of the the ones I got. So there is some bias in the data, the artwork it was this model was trained in. A lot of questions are being brought up uh, about that. How how many of you use Chat GPT? At Chat GPT, sometimes ever so often that the model gives you an answer that's not right. Right? Um, don't ask it to do your proof. Uh, by inductions, you know, sometimes one of the steps it'll get wrong, you tell the model, hey, are you sure about step number two? Um, it'll it'll actually say like, oh yeah, my bad, that's my bad. Um, but the thing I want to mention is like, these models are not searching around the internet for answers or whatever. It's just uh, reflecting on the data it's been trained with, right? Um, so some of that data is not correct all the time. So it'll answer it in really high confidence, which is something they're working on uh, fixing in that model, right? Um, they have some engineers that are going in and manually kind of telling the model, maybe these inputs are not correct. These ones are correct. So they're, they are working on things like that. I will, so, I will also mention as well, um, when Microsoft kind of like unveiled their being AI, I guess, mm. they kind of like had like this greater issue with like, having the model, like having like, you know, their GPT version of like being kind of like use internet data, mm -hmm. like the latest up-to-date internet data in order to like, you know, give you some wrong answers and stuff. So that's why, you know, I tend like, you know, like don't rely, don't like fully rely on these, on like, you know, chat GPT or like Bing AI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until like, you know, they become like much more well trained and all that and you know there's always going to be like errors like this all the time like no machine learning model is ever going to be perfect you know mm -hmm. so that's why you know you do you want to stray away from it from as like as fast as possible but i still encourage you guys to mess around with it you know mm -hmm. but don't use it as like your main way of like you know doing your homework you know just asking it just, to explain new concepts yeah. is, is really good too yeah, yeah. Um, it does a good job with and, and don't and don't write your essays from it. I know you guys want to like yeah. I'm just saying it doesn't always write a good essay. I, I don't, I'll tell you that. Have you seen that news where like some lady for the sh like Michigan shooting 
um, at a school. She uh, she was like a chief, the chair of diversity inclusion at their school. And for a public email, she used Chat GPT to address the the shooting. And like it was a sorry email, but at the very bottom it says written by Chat GPT. So it's just like wow, like. Some people need to really think think things through before just using these applications blindly, right? Um, you don't want to have this be your personality. Um, so I I, I kind of wanted to end this. Uh, a good way of ending this workshop is just like let's let's come up with some idea like ways machine learning. How do you think machine learning can improve our surroundings? I want you guys to think of concepts of like sustainability accessibility uh maybe like some user centered design and then maybe like just give me one example or something you can kind of get the ball rolling how ai can improve your life or like solve it like a niche problem i guess like if you guys want to you guys, you guys could probably start with something that's like on campus you know mm -hmm. I'll give an example. Uh, I, I DJ, so I guess um, clustering using like k-means hey and stuff like that to kind of understand my playlists. You can kind of grab, there, there's some uh, tools, Spotalyze, for uh, plotting the danceability of your songs. So as a DJ, that's really useful. It kind of, you can make groupings of songs that are have certain characteristics to make playlists. So I use that that website and they they have some data plots for that. So that's an example for me. Um, I think like another good example from my end. Um, how many guys know what GIS is? What? Is it the um, the tool in which you can plot stuff on on like geographic maps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um a lot of times, like, you know, there are companies out here that want like, you know, the geographical data being like updated and like changed on a daily basis. A lot of people sometimes like train models using that geographical data in order to, you know, come up with some conclusive results, such as like where to like, you know, place bike lanes or where to have like proper sidewalks, you know, because usually sometimes you know, it makes planning a lot more, makes planning for city infrastructure a lot more easier. So I would say like my probably good example would be like coming up with like more like bike lanes mm -hmm. around campus. Cause oftentimes you see a lot of people scooting around and like mm -hmm. you can like oftentimes like get crushed by someone riding an electric scooter, I guess, you know? Mm -hmm. I actually nearly got crushed by one today <laughs> and i got pretty pissed about it so yeah you can you can like totally like you know create a machine learning model and like feed it geographical data that takes some of the best like bike lane infrastructure from other cities and use it to like like apply to a place mm. or city like uc riverside and like be like okay find me the best places to install like bike lanes you know just in order to you know have some safe public transport and yeah you can like probably like reduce getting killed if you want to i mean i know no i know i not i know like change is not going to come overnight but like rules will be enforced you know at some point so yeah what else no Oh. Mm. I think it's like more central in the Yeah. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely, like during COVID, a lot of data scientists were uh, being employed to uh, figure out disease spread um, and make predictions. Uh huh. Oh yeah, I I can I think that's true. Something. Yeah. I guess you have it turned on on your phone and yeah, yeah cuz I remember catching covid once and my iPhone detected me so mm. yeah, it's, it's one way. I'm thinking cuz it was raining today, maybe the habit would would like to know um how many customers are going to be coming in today. I know during when it's rainy, a, a lot of people tend to eat out, um uh, take take out. Stuff like that, like local businesses find that useful, um, matching weather data with predicting how many people are coming in, how many that translates to how many, how many people I need to have on call in my restaurant, stuff like that. Um, I think I have some other examples here, energy management, transportation, climate change, text to speech, a lot of, uh, Sign language translation can be done through machine learning, captioning for movies and stuff like that. Um, User-centered design, I guess um, if chat GPT can write your website and handle your backend too, it can also understand um, through how the users use on, uh, how, how users interact with your websites, you can figure out the best ways to lay out your website and stuff like that. So machine learning is everywhere. Um, I wanted to, to plug this in. Coursera has a great deep learning specialization taught by Andrew NG uh, from Stanford. And if you do have a California Public Library card, shout out Sir B for letting me know about this. I, I was paying $50 a month uh, for it, but you can get a, a certification, pop that on your resume shows that like you you've gone through this course and stuff like that they have other courses too it doesn't have to be machine learning um if you want to have something on your resume that says like i'm certified in something coursera has that linkedin learning also if you're a ucr student you have uh access to linkedin learning pre like premium uh most people have to pay for that so take advantage of this stuff i know our school doesn't really advertise hey we have all these free things one thing I think is like, if they do have a large amount of people on it, they, they'd have to pay a, a higher premium or something. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure, but make it, take advantage of these resources. Uh, yeah, they're super helpful. This one was a great one um, for deep learning, especially if you're going to take that CS171 class. Um, walking through this course will make sure, it, it'll make sure you, you do well in that class. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's um, it's five five courses. Each one is five weeks. Um, but if you really set a schedule, you can crank those out pretty fast. I think like in a half a week you could do more instead of five weeks if you really sit down. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, and I should also throw out there like if you guys want to. If you guys want to get you guys can always like you know play around with these python libraries mm. the psych psychic learn it's one of the basic ones you guys should probably know about irvine has a machine learning yeah they also irvine, i think irvine has a machine learning li library as well yeah uh tensorflow that's kind of one of the big ones that's kind of like the neural network one mm. it's a bit too advanced but if we're if you're wanting to you know let's say take this course here a course and learn about you know um no networks that's a i think you can like understand tensorflow pretty quickly mm -hmm. but um yeah that's pretty much it uh i should know um for our next workshop uh it's not technically going to be a workshop it's actually going to be a a speaker so we're gonna like bring someone over we're going to bring like an author from this book here. So I actually read this book a lot. It's called Ace to Data Science Interview. 
and it teaches a lot about like how people like how to basically land their dream job as like a data scientist you know as a data analyst or like or machine learning engineer uh we'll be inviting nick singh he's kind of like an ex-facebook kind of guy he also he also started like a data startup and it's going to be coming up um like coming monday from like five to six here in this room so yeah i encourage all of you guys to come here if you guys want like want to learn how to ace the data science interview because we know it's like you know it might it might not be as difficult it might be like more simpler but it's still very very complex to pass the data science interview like i probably failed like multiple times but yeah so i recommend you guys all come um it's gonna be a great time it'll be from 5 to 6 p.m. on Monday here in the ACM club room. But yeah, make sure you guys be here. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you.